Good morning, everyone. We're here in Portland Place for M&M Global's first ever Thought Leadership Roundtable, ready for the launch of our new website on the 3rd of September. We're in partnership with Publicitas here, and we're going to discuss the ins and outs of mobile and video over the next 40 minutes. So to help us do that are some uh, far learned people than me in mobile and video. So we'll start to my left, which is uh, Dominic Jacobin, who is the head of digital for EMEA from Publicitas. So hello, Dominic. How are you? <laughs> Then we have um, Shen Wen Tung, who is the head of digital strategy at MEC. Next to me here, we have the birthday girl. It's uh, Tia <laughs> Castango from um, Visium, who has uh, given up her birthday to come and uh, discuss video and mobile. I couldn't think of a better a birthday treat for you. Um, she's the global head of innovation at um, Visium and content. So next to her, we have Matt Prentice, who is the um, global innovation officer, I believe, at PhD. Is that correct? Excellent. Yeah. Oh, ma marvellous, marvellous. And then we have um, Alex Newman, who is our head of mobile, Amir at OMD International and OMG. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> so I suppose w we should really start. Something we discussed earlier was the fact that uh, mobile and video, we see these wonderful stats and you think, wow, that's a, a no brainer for brands to start using mobile and start using video. And some of the conversations we're having with people around the globe, some of our festival of media events, you see that um, we all talk this, this beautiful theory about how mobile and video is working, yet it seems to me that not a lot of brands actually really understand it and are actually utilizing it. Who would like to pick up on that? Don't be shy. Oh, yeah, no. Tia, come on. Um, I think, I mean, from my perspective, um, like last year after the uh, Facebook um, video uh, player changed and the algorithm changed, brands really started to use it much more. So between May and December, I think um, branded video on Facebook only increased by 50%. And uh, by December, it had Facebook video had overtaken YouTube. So... I think it depends how you classify it in many ways, and native video has had uh, a massive surge since then. Yeah, so I think it's because um, we're still looking at mobile advertising as the main metric to judge that, but actually if we start looking at how video in a native context is used, then the picture is very different, not as negative as um, in, my, in my look. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Facebook's last set of figures, I think their, their figures are up 40% year on year. And if you're naturally, if you're advertising on Facebook, 80% of that's through mobile. So I think a lot of brands are kind of getting into mobile kind of by accident in some instances. But um, if you're advertising on Facebook, if you're advertising on YouTube, naturally the majority of that inventory will be served via mobile and, and mm. inevitably through video as well in order to take advantage of that. So I think, you know, whilst mobile advertising, some of the stats around the 60% drop, maybe display focus, but I think mobile advertising as a medium or mobile as a delivery mechanism for comms is growing and it's getting more sophisticated, which is why some of these decisions may be away from display into Facebook, YouTube, etc., are starting to happen and start to become a bit more learned, so to speak. I was going to say, one of, one of the things we try and do for mobile and video is make it more as integrated as part of the overall digital strategy, rather than having a, a mobile specific, a video specific, which brands can be a little bit more nervous about. If you bring it into an integrated proposal where they are elements of the campaign, and you look at each of those elements as you go along and you optimise to, to the best performing, um, then you know, from a brand's point of view, they're seeing a better performance. Uh, we've seen this work with our clients that are naturally leading in digital. So they're more accepting of just an integrated plan and they expect that. And when their campaigns have mobile integrated as part of an overall display plan, you know, it's just very easy for them to see the return on that investment. Um, and when they're comfortable with that, it's easier to pick up on new mobile platforms, like when Periscope comes out. You know, they're happy to test and learn, and they don't have high expectations, but they're wanting to see what type of engagement they can get. So it's really helping us kind of prove the effectiveness of mobile just by integrating it with the plan, like you said, um, and allow us to move the conversation towards more exciting things that are like really, truly, deeply, and differently mobile-first uh, content. That's an interesting one. You all kind of mentioned their ROI and effectiveness. Is there a, an industry standard, maybe, maybe globally, maybe regionally, that actually we're all adhering to? Is that something, do you think, we need? Is it a bit like the Wild West in certain places? Say that um, mobile, unfortunately, is characterised by fragmentation and complexity. Um, there is no standard uh, measurement for anything. I think it's up to us as agencies and clients to really 
or as agencies to really help recommend to our clients what technology they should be using for measurement and attribution within mobile and actually all digital completely. Um, I know at Omnicom, we certainly have our own suppliers that we have uh, contract uh, contractual relationships with in terms of uh, recommending solutions for this. Um, there's some great technologies out there. I think the days of saying that measurement doesn't exist and that's the reason not to use mobile, I, I believe are gone. I think some of it can be complex to integrate in with existing technology stacks, but um, I believe there are definitely solutions out there which allow us to properly measure. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the days of, of mobile just being deep pocket marketing are well gone. Um, and we're now uh, certainly in the, the region where mobile should perform as well as anything else. It should be measured uh, and it should deliver ROI. Simple. I almost think it was used as an excuse because it was the new thing to be afraid of. And let's be honest, back four years ago, it was like 2% of spend maybe. So it was really kind of like a red herring for why they shouldn't look into measurement. And now as data is everywhere and our com comfort with measurement across all digital platforms is increasing and the technologies we have and the models that we use are much more sophisticated, um, there really is no excuse. And I think it's more about that confidence that we have as um, agencies to present um, real and robust measurement frameworks to clients. And you know, mobile just happens now to be part of it. I think it's, um, uh, it's like a process and uh, it's moving in the right direction. I mean, clients are still very cautious because of all the viewability issues that um, were debated last year. It's still at 40, 50%. So that is something that clients worry about. They worry about transparency because there is still around 10 to 20% risk as to where the content is gonna be placed. And also the measurement as to what classes as a view um, is still very murky because if you think that, for instance, even just comparing YouTube and Facebook, YouTube is 30 seconds, Facebook three seconds, now they're giving the opportunity to count it at 10 seconds. Um, so it is all, and also the autoplay muted um, makes it very different from a uh, YouTube experience. Um, so like retention on Facebook, for instance, only 21% to 30 seconds, while on YouTube is four times that. So there's all those questions, but I think clients understand that they can't just uh, shy away from it because of that, and that is a, a process, and everyone is trying to work towards solving the issues. Yeah. And I suppose one of those one of those issues that's growing quite a lot. I was with a, a company called Sourcepoint Sourcepoint the other day, and we were having a conversation about ad blocking, and obviously ad blocking huge on desktops, becoming bigger on on tablets. What do you think the the impact of that will be on on mobile and mobile marketing spend? This is it's quite an interesting uh, topic. I think it's been debated quite a lot recently. There's a, some big PR announcements about ad blocking coming in. Ad blocking in mobile has actually existed since the start. So I don't see it as being anything particularly new. It's just it's a bit of a spotlight happening. Personally, I've work in mobile, I have done for 10 years now. A lot of mobile advertising, I'll call it bad mobile advertising from a personal perspective. Uh, perspective I would love an ad blocker or I, I actually do yeah. use an ad blocker but I think um, some ads are actually getting really exciting so some of the touch centric opportunities to play and investigate content I think I actually enjoy um, I believe it's an opportunity to actually really supercharge the output of what we do as an industry and it's then that I believe that ad blocking won't you know, be it as effect or not be such a big issue as we're making out it to be at the moment. I think it, it's a little bit of a red herring, but uh, I'd love to see all the rubbish stuff blocked out. So that's that's a good thing. No, I totally agree. I think, you know, iOS 9 is going to be interesting because it's going to almost encourage ad blocking and there could be some cynical views around that. But putting that aside, I think, you know, brands have to realise that putting an ad in front of someone and just interfering with their experience is, you know, that's not just not right and it's not engaging. So brands need to kind of utilise new technology, new formats, things that are immersive and actually interest a consumer um, and encourage them not to block ads. You know, let, let's get away from just an interstitial that's completely irrelevant and, and it just turns a consumer off. You know, let's get to formats that actually engage consumers. Uh. And also 85% of time spent on um, mobile is actually in-app um, anyway. And at the moment, um, you can't really, I mean, they're starting to um, take over there as well, but the, it's, it's minimal. And I think the more um, clients, I mean, I come from a content background, so for me, ad blocking is actually good um, because it pushes people. Uh, I know, you can throw me out. <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. We, we, we want a good conversation, don't worry. Um, but, um, you know, it pushes clients to look more at uh, content, at sponsorship. There are some channels where uh, ad blocking doesn't work, like search um, or digital out of home as well. 
So there are many solutions around that, and in-app um, is extremely important. And I don't know if you saw the New York Times now, just this week or last week launched uh, this new moment planning thing, which is uh, a, a much better way to plan a story around uh, mobile and moments throughout the day. So the more we see that, and um, the better it is for everyone, because I really don't think that ads are uh, created for the mobile uh, experience were ever fit for purpose. And whilst app blocking has you know, profound implications for display inventory, with regards to Facebook inventory, YouTube, in-stream, in-feed formats, where you're getting actually quite interesting bits and pieces coming through now, whether it be GIFs, Cinegraphs, Vines, et cetera, et cetera, um, those kinds of formats which encourage creativity by their design are actually um, filtering through into engagement rates with branded content as well. So it's, that, it's taken those cues from other platforms where ad blocking by its very nature isn't going to be possible because otherwise you're not going to be allowed to use the service. So um, if we can take those um, the, the behaviours that we're taking on board in terms of those platforms, port that across to display elements, then, then we can start to um, benefit from both worlds as well. So it's kind of almost a case of being really inventive and coming up mm. with new ideas and new ways of putting across, you know, we talk about content yeah. and contents there obviously from native advertising to, to video usage and, and actually I suppose it's coming up with those, those inventive ways. Yeah. Is, that, is that the key to ensuring that, and I suppose keeping brands ahead of the game is kind of giving them the options to say actually you could do something really exciting here. There's, yeah, there's more and more demands on consumer or people's attention. And it's you know, a job of a media agency or, or comms in, to bring people, bring that attention and point it towards the story you want to tell them and ensure that that, that experience that they have then, then filters through to an action in that brand's favour. So whether it, be for, um, whether it be in feed, whether it be in stream, whether it be typical display units, it's our job to ensure that we pull people into what we want to tell them. And yeah, it will be difficult in some instances if there's blocking, but we need to you know, navigate a way, a way around that. Yeah. And I suppose that comes with a kind of per hyper personalised messaging, doesn't it? So we talk mm. about ads that people don't necessarily want, and that's that's becoming more and more of a key thing. But I suppose you've got that you've got that kind of balance between people say no to receiving any more data or putting, get scared about putting more data in. But I suppose the irony is the more data they put in, the more personalised mm. those ads can be. How do you how do you face that challenge? I mean, how do you explain actually to a brand you're putting a campaign and you, you really want, they need to put more and more details in to get more and more personalised? How, how do you get around well, that? Well, we, we spend a lot of time talking to our clients about the opportunity that mobile delivers in terms of learning more about a consumer on an individual level and actually tapping into their natural behaviours via a mobile device. And I think a lot of mobile advertising that we see is, I'm going to call it spam, it's just, you know, a general message, nothing about me. I might have looked at a website three weeks ago and I'm still getting a, you know, I'm not going to mention any companies, but a message related to that three weeks ago. Whereas the opportunity, I think, is to look at me as a user, look at where I go, what I do, what I look at, everything I do on my phone, and then tap into that behaviour and message me in a way that I'm going to find interesting and want to engage with. And I think that's probably the most exciting opportunity a brand has. But to be able to do that, you're going to need to have that data and have access to that data. So it's probably not convincing the brands as much as it's convincing the individuals and then being very aware of data privacy laws and this moving, this moving landscape. I think that's probably the critical issue that the industry faces over the next 18, 24 months. Um, I know there's some new legislation coming out in the EU very shortly and I think I'm personally very interested to see how that moves things along. Um, I think that is going to really either make or break this opportunity to be hyper relevant and personal. Yeah, I think some of the emerging technologies in mobile, like mobile wallet and uh, beacons, enable uh, brands and, and advertisers to understand consumer activity much more. You know, mobile wallets give you a lot of information about a consumer spending habits, and you can utilize that data to make sure your advertising is much more relevant. You know, beacons give you information about locations and what users have done. And if we take these kind of pieces of technology, bind them together, and utilize that to make the experience much more interesting for, for the consumer, or much more relevant, you know, offers that they actually want, rather than just spamming them, which is pretty much what mobile has been, as you said, over the last few years. It's pretty much just throwing ads in front of a consumer, interrupting their experience. And of course, that's why they're going to be very happy to use ad blockers, because that's all they've had for the last three years. I mean, as Dominic was saying, you know, with mobile basically operating as a sensor, it gives off so much exhaust in data, right? It's just giving off context after context, intent after intent. And I think 
what we should be doing as like just the, the media agencies and the ones that are recommending the strategy is really coming up with a perspective of the consumer's behavior through the time of day, as we have tried to do, but now we have so much more information to back that up and really find unique insight for a specific brand, um, what the consumer is looking for doing, actually doing when they're out and about, rather than claims behavior, it's actual behavior. And that can inform the way that we come up with creative and come up with plans. And so for us, yes, you can get my, very specific and personalized, but I think that's just native Facebook advertising, right? And that's nothing different from what they'd be seeing on desktop. Um, where it's interesting for us is to have like actual data um, to support what we think would be most effective creatively or messaging and content-wise. I think the, uh, the big difference for clients, I, they fully appreciate the need to operate in that way, and they like the fact that you can be much more effective and efficient. Uh, the scary part is the fact that they need to relook at completely how they organize themselves internally as well um, to face those um, challenges. Because if you um, imagine before you used to produce assets uh, through one advertising agency, bank them out through your media agency, and that was your job done. Now, because of native, um, because of everything that we're discussing, you can't, there's no one solution fits all. So you need to work as a, let's say, head of content at a brand. You need to work with an ecosystem of 20, 30 partners in order to be able to deliver properly on those platforms. And they can be publishers, they can be the PR agency, the media agency, the creative agency. So um, it's quite a big ecosystem of partners that you have to manage. And uh, there is no right, you know, th there is no uh, easy solution. But in reality, that's what needs to happen. It's simple, but not easy. Um, and that's what is the scary part, is an organisational um, element as well. Do you think that needs to be changed internally for brands? Do you think they need to change the way they now set up in this new kind of evolving media yeah. landscape? Do you think there's too many out there that are still a little backwards, should we say, in the way that they, they operate and they, they look at media? Yeah, and I mean, they are reinventing themselves, a lot of them. It's not right for everyone because you can't have every brand becoming a publisher all of a sudden. Um, and it's still very difficult to understand where you should stay, uh, who is the right one to handle your um, content marketing. So it, it's not um, a simple decision to make because uh, it's very important who you put um, your content in the hands of. Um, but I think some brands are trying uh, more than others, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Well, well, it's like coupled with the complexity that an organization has. You know, you've got your global clients and then they've got their own, like many, many market uh, internal stakeholders as well. So they're facing difficulty in, you know, translating a global idea into many different localized markets. And then you come to them on the side with like, and then you have to have all these formats of content and you have to be ready to turn, you know, an idea from concept into uh, creative, you know, within a couple hours, you know, if you really want to be on top of it. So they're facing complexity from, you know, top down or like in out, as well as just like the fragmentation of what is possible. So I think, you know, processes and organization are probably what's, I don't know, not holding us back is the right word, but it's, it's the main barrier to being as agile and dynamic as I think brands want to be. Um, you can write something down on paper and this is how we should do things, but it's getting all the behaviors to change and all the people to come along with you to, to, be, to embrace you know, all the possibilities. And that's just difficult when you've got, well, this is how you know, our brand operates. This is how our global marketing you know, campaign idea co goes from concept to delivery. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot of linear processes and what we genuinely need is much more circular. Do we think we're getting closer to that, though, in, in 2015? Do we think we've, we've got a lot closer than we have over the last few years? Maybe certain brands are. You know, I think, to your point, yeah, it's really brands who embrace themselves as being publishers for a certain purpose versus those that have, you know, they have other jobs to do besides, um, you know, surprising and delighting, very conscious, fashion-conscious consumers. <laughs> <laughs> Very conscious indeed as well. I think in the, in, in the fashion world is, is quite a nice one. Are there any parts, I suppose, or regions of the world where you think actually this year, 2015, has really kind of stood out in some of the mobile work that's been achieved and that's been done? I know we were in MENA, in the MENA region earlier this year and I went out to Saudi Arabia and 
Virgin Mobile, for what form of a different brand, had launched their first only kind of digital campaign across Saudi to kind of remarkable results. Is there, there are any particular regions, areas that you think are getting it just right and, and why? Well, I'm always impressed by the work that comes out of our Nordic markets. I think they are some of the most advanced digitally, specifically in mobile. Every year I go out to see my teams out there and they always blow us away. And I think they're them. And actually, I was going to say our UAE teams as well. I mean, that Virgin campaign was one of our teams that did that. Um, those two regions are probably some of our strongest that we see within our network so yeah I'd say those regions are really good and obviously the UK is good as well um, even in some cases I'm going to be a bit controversial and say maybe ahead of some of our US counterparts that say that they're always uh, leading the, uh, the uh, blazing a trail in this space um, yeah I just think that those regions are really really cutting edge I also think if you look at um, Europe itself, we've suddenly seen Germany and France um, going crazy on e-commerce. I think <clears throat> there was a report recently, one in five transactions, retail transactions in France are now made on a mobile device, 7% um, in Germany. So they've come from, you know, they've, they've been lagging behind quite a lot, but all of a sudden those kind of countries seem to be exploding as well. Uh, and like you say, Saudi Arabia, we're seeing a lot of activity there. A lot of the brands we work with are running campaigns or wanting to run mobile campaigns in Saudi Arabia. Um, so that's a very, you know, fast growing and emerging area. Um, it's just, it's dangerous in those kind of problem, those kind of areas that makes it very difficult because if you want relevant advertising you need the data to back it up um, but getting data for some of those territories is pretty tough yeah. well particularly France and Germany they have their own privacy czars these days yeah. don't they which I was about to say there's some real if you if you can make it in those two countries you really can uh, can make it globally I'm, I'm sure but are there any other regions or areas you guys think are um, I um, I'm always quite interested in what comes out of uh, India and also some African countries because um, they actually are using mobile as um, an essential way to resolve um, business problems and I think that's where it becomes very interesting so it's away from uh, um, the tech gimmicky side and more how can we solve a, an effective business problem in some ways. And I think PNG, for instance, has been doing some very interesting work in uh, India and in some African countries exactly to get around um, the fact that you can't, everyone has got mobile and not everyone has got a desktop or a computer in those countries. And actually that medium becomes extremely important to, um, to drive business growth. So yeah, I'm always very interested in those regions. Likewise, China as well. I see amazing work coming from China. They, feel, they seem to be in terms of where we were. No, no, they seem to be three or four years ahead in terms of where we are now. Yeah. Some of the messaging platforms and the work I see around that and micro payments, these behaviours are just completely normal, whereas at the moment we're just starting to get to grips with what Apple Pay can do, whereas in China we've been doing that for years, and that's having profound implications for you know, closing the loop between exposing someone to a piece of advertising and then closing the loop between how that drives commerce or brand equity. So, yeah, I've always been impressed and just you know, use that as a constant source of inspiration for what can be done elsewhere. Yeah. And do you think, we, we touched on it briefly earlier, we talked about a global campaign that is then spread out into the different regions. I was uh, at Cannes and I, I heard Jonathan Milton, who obviously likes to be fairly controversial just for controversy's sake at times, and uh, he was talking about Airbnb and he, he mentioned that brands that, that think that there's no such thing as one global campaign, there's not a global idea that can work everywhere else, need to kind of sharpen up what they do and need to change their whole philosophy. Do we think there is, there is one global idea but then it takes into the nuances of each region or do we think we need to create mobile and video campaigns that are just very different in every single region? I think Airbnb just proved uh, that actually because um, uh, I was reading about what they're doing in China. They've had a, a massive success lately because they have adapted what they do best, which is their model, but completely adapted to the Chinese market. So utilizing uh, the app, they understood that by trying to work with the Chinese consumer in their market, that was going to really then um, put them on top of the consideration set when Chinese people travel. And uh, they utilize they utilize all the apps and everything that is available in the Chinese market to really connect with the Chinese consumer. So, yes, you can have uh, um, a, an idea that is uh, globally driven, but unless, especially for certain markets like China, but even in France, in Germany, unless you you really kind of almost reinvent it for that market um, in the, in the context of contextual advertising and content and what people want to hear more of or not, um, then you can't you can't succeed. 
Yeah, I think that the you know the value of local expertise you, you can't outweigh that. You really can't because uh, every some brands yes they could have a global campaign because it's a, a very generic brand. But many brands because of the differences and nuances in, in different countries and um, how those countries perceive brands, you need that local expertise to kind of give you that advice to help you make sure that you are using the best mediums and the best channels um, for that brand in that kind of territory. So the local expertise I think is very valuable as well. Yeah, I think it's the job of um, the people who lead the global marketing team to really set the ambition and really set the you know safety net saying it's okay to, to really own your that brand idea, but we really want to aspire because you have to push markets to really imagine what could be possible. And I think with that sense of you know ownership, they can actually create what's genuinely valuable in that in that market. What Unfortunately, we can also, what we do see is a lot of kind of distillation of like, oh, this is the one thing that kind of works universally and it ends up being quite boring and generic and not particular to that brand. So you can get really kind of like average work or you can get extremely powerful work. And it's the, it's the role of the global, Asian, the global um, teams to really push and accelerate, you know, the ambitions of everybody around the world. working for. A great example for me is Apple. You look at Apple's advertising, I think you'll find it's pretty similar in every single market. You know, shot on iPhone 6 has gone everywhere. Wherever I go, I see these massive billboards with amazing photos. If I talk to some of my more commerce-driven clients, I think you'll find that they operate on a very central basis, but always with um, maybe some local knowledge incorporated into their central marketing, but they, they operate on a very fleet, fast, reactive way to generate the most amount of money they can out of their campaigns. And other some clients, as you say, global leadership, local activation with local knowledge. I think I, I, There is not one size that fits all for all clients. It really does depend on who they are and what they do. I suppose one of the key things is, are we at a point where we're persuading more and more clients to use more of their budget in that mobile space now, as opposed to kind of two, three years ago? Is that becoming more of a reality? Because we look in, in some quarters this year, people are talking about a, a reduction in terms of the amount of mobile spend this year from quarter to quarter. You know, but we're, we're saying here that actually spending is, is getting bigger in that sense, or where do, where do we kind of stand on that? Yeah, I would say so. Um, the reduction, I think, is because of what um, it has been looked at, which is probably ad uh, mobile spend rather than how uh, clients' brands are using native, um, because that has certainly uh, received a big increase. Also, what counts as uh, video digital uh, spend that is accessed also by mobile. So how do you split that? Um, so, I, I mean, certainly clients are still very cautious for a number of um, the number of reasons that we mentioned earlier, so the, the how viewability, transparency, and all that. But I think that um, the spend is certainly um, is going up. The focus is certainly increased one way or another, and it's the way it is attributed to mobile that perhaps needs to be relooked at. Yeah, from our point of view, where we sit is kind of slightly unique in the sense that on one hand, we've got our media owners, and on the other hand, we've got our advertising clients. So what we're always striving to do is to ensure that you know we're maxim maximising both sides. So from our, e our media owners, we've got to be taking innovative new tech to them, new formats and things that's going to increase the opportunities for monetization of their inventory. Uh, and for our advertisers, we need exactly the same. We need, we need new formats that are quite exciting, that they want to test, they want to try, that can increase the CTRs and the performance, and again, back to the ROI. So yeah, it's quite unique from that point of view, that the, the job we're trying to do with technology. I think the other one interesting um, question that came up last week, actually, with one of our clients uh, was, um, they were saying, well, we can't cut TV uh, down or we can't get rid of TV because when we have TV on, we see a search spike by 40, you know, 400% on, uh, on our website. But um, the question is, have you ever tried to invest all that money into something else, yeah. which probably uh, no client has ever done. So if you're just cutting that off but not putting anywhere else, well, of course, you're not going to see that. But I, I haven't seen any client that has taken the media spend and completely reinvested in something else. And I'm not saying that that is necessarily the right thing to do, but it's certainly not, there is no comparison at the moment that is uh, like for like. In terms of 
advertising communications, you have to advertise where the audience are. If the audience is spending increasing amounts of time on their mobiles, which you, know, you can't deny that, we just need to find a way in order to unlock the potential of that. And for most of the brands that I've worked across, it, whether it be in a global role or a PhD or previously in a, in a local role, you, you can't deny that more budget is going into that space. It's just closing the loop in terms of knowledge and expertise of whether that's actually paying back, whether it be on brand equity or whether it be more direct response in terms of um, attributing that back to the channel. And I think in, in most instances, you, you see the numbers from Facebook, you see the numbers from Google in terms of what they're reporting back. I think most people are, are seeing the benefit of it. I just think in terms of the attribution, as you were mentioning a minute ago, is that mobile display or is it is that paid social? What's the difference? And I think it's these kinds, of, we need to have a common sort of a description of what mobile is in order to attribute the actual growth or, or decline in certain instances. I mean, there's a few different things I think here that we're all covering that so number one I can't see there's a client anywhere in the world that isn't recognizing that mobile is important to them I mean, number two big platforms Facebook Google mobile is incorporated within it it's very hard to distinguish to spend digitally that goes across one screen versus another um, I know that we can't necessarily track all that so I don't believe that as we've said mobile as a whole is declining in terms of investment I think it's definitely going up it's just how we account for it um, and thirdly, I did actually see a campaign last year in the US, VW, for the launch of the new Golf, launched it just on mobile, which was kind of surprising to me, pretty brave. And they generated the most amount of test drives and brochure requests they ever had for a launch of a new car. Now, I think they are, on their own, a pretty brave client willing to try something new. I certainly don't know of any of our clients at Omnicom that have just done a new launch just on mobile. And if they did, I, or were they interested, I'd like to talk to them about how they might do that. But um, <laughs> Cool's gone into Volkswagen. Yeah, already, isn't it? exactly. <laughs> They're not one of ours. <laughs> um, but I, I do believe that I talk a lot about convincing 60 year old plus CMOs to be brave and try something different. And I, for one, am waiting for that generation to leave their jobs and for the new, for the new uh, breed of, of marketing person who thinks a bit differently to get that power to actually do something different and take control. So I think all of us around this table pretty much recognize that there is new opportunities out there, you know, technology, mobile, whatever, it is connected devices there is such an opportunity to have a much better brand story with a consumer but i don't i think we're just sort of dipping our toes in the water we're testing things some cases we're not really really learning and trying new things as much as we could there's certain brands out there that are exceptions but i believe there is so much untapped opportunity out there and i i for one i'm looking for those brave marketeers that want to try something new i think also we have to have a collaborative approach now much more than before with our creative agencies, you know, because they're used to creating f creative in a certain format, and we have to say, listen, it has to be portrait, you know, your video, need, you need a portrait version of your video. You need something that, imagine if you could use touch and sensory kind of input into your creative experience, you know, like, we have to partner with them as much as we sell to our um, clients and educate them. We need to be educating our creative agencies and partnering with them to really just, you know, come up with formats that are genuinely relevant today and will speak and resonate with our consumers in the native formats that we know are much more effective. So there's a lot of opportunity laterally as well for us to move the, the bravery and the innovation forward. From our end, in, our, in this space, we've actually um, grown our own capability in terms of we have a whole 60-man development team that build content experiences just for mobile and connected devices that we've married to our, I'll call it media planning operation for mobile. So actually, we believe it's so important that you need to be able to have that capability in-house so you can offer like a joined-up service to a client. And we're seeing huge take-up of that because I think creative agencies are used to shooting TV commercials and, you know, multi-million pound things. And when it gets to this... They don't know any more than we do, and they're probably a little bit not interested because it might not be as big budget as some of the other stuff. So I think, again, that is a really key issue that we need to get over. And that's what I was saying earlier about the fact that now the creative process in, is in the hands of many stakeholders and uh, probably that's what's scary for clients, but um, you can't rely just on one source for the creation. There might be, yeah, your media agency that creates your mobile um, assets and your creative agency that does your TV assets and then all the native formats done by the publishers. So the ecosystem is, yeah, it's much more complicated. Yeah. Although in a good way, bringing media agencies and media Absolutely. back to the, to the top top table and, and having a much mm. a much bigger say I think the irony from my point is we got these creative agencies and actually the data that we've got now as an industry and in particular from a media perspective actually ironically can make their 
campaigns so much more creative if they think about it. And I, and I think you're right. I think there's some scared, worried people because they're not quite sure how to do it. And I, I wonder how we bring those, how we make those marketeers brave. I mean, Unilever have just started a new planning process where the fundamental channels um, lead the creative development process. So at the start of a briefing um, for a set of projects, fundamental channels going, not just TV, pay, social, outdoor, whatever, but how those channels are used. That informs the creative brief, so, and then the assets have to be created against those fundamental channels. So you start to think about how it's going to be deployed and how it's going to be received before you think about how the idea is going to be shot in TV, for example. So it's, it's having that up front and, and how we want to ultimately get, our, get the com um, comes across the consumer embedded right at the start rather than at the end in terms of that TV asset then being chopped up in different ways to fit the formats that are available it needs to be pulled right at the front and um, brands that are doing that more often at a global level um, uh, are seeing the benefits of that and if you if you're a startup and you had a hundred pounds you'd make the right thing for the right channel in that one instance I think it's the global organizations where there's so many stakeholders involved uh, are kind of being guided you know it's, it's harder to turn that ship so to speak but you know if, if you had a hundred pounds you could invest it in something you'd invest it in the right thing once and you do it straight away. So um, it's just ensuring that, that that thinking is embedded right up front, I think. Yeah, I think what we've seen is, you know, with the campaigns that have done really well, we've, you know, we've used influencers, we've used UGC, we've really just gone to consumers to get them to make the campaign come alive. And that is something that as media agency, we can do very easily and we've done very successfully. You know, the, the engagement rates, you know, exceeded all expectations, the visits to the website exceeded all expectations. And I think it's because, you know, when you aren't in charge of like the brand template and you can actually connect consumers to your brand still you can actually be you we work around the rules you you are very creative in how you get consumers to look at your brand and media agencies have just as much um access to consumers as any other agency or and we just want to connect them to the brand so we're using consumers directly to be the campaign and be part of it i suppose that ties nicely into the fact that you don't have to be a, a you know 300 million pounds spend in brands to actually make an effective mobile campaign. I think that's that's one of the keys, isn't it, for us now? Video and mobile. Actually, you don't necessarily need to have TV ads. You can you can use mobile and videos. Great options for you with which to carry this out. Whether you're a, a large brand or a small brand, and have great effective results. Yeah, one of the bespoke formats we do on mobile. Um, you know, as long as the campaign value is sufficient, we uh, the creative agency is included. So the creative is actually built for that campaign as well, um, because it's very bespoke. So it has to be built. So the easiest way to do it is include it in the campaign cost. Yeah. And so for, for 2016, I want us to kind of focus on what, what, what the future holds. We've kind of discussed 2015 and, and where we are and, and what we've seen so far this year. What do we think will be, I suppose, the game changers for us in 2016? And I suppose the kind of, you know, attributing how the spend is how the spend is spent and how it looks at so that attribution, you know, how we should be as an industry saying, well, yes, mobile is here, here and here, but you've just thought it as here. And actually, it's all of these things combined. What territories do we think are going to really kind of up the up the ante in, in 2016? And, uh, you know, how, how do we get and continue to keep the momentum flowing with with mobile and video? I think that Facebook is going to get their act together um, on uh, the two fronts of uh, controversy of this year, which was how they measure uh, the video views, how their video counts, which uh, is going to align uh, more with YouTube, which is going to make a huge difference in the confidence that clients have in uh, spending their money on uh, Facebook video. And also, they're going to start paying, finally, uh, creators and influencers, which until now they haven't done. And so far, uh, I think they had, um, uh, I don't know how many billion um, uh, pir piracy videos on, on, on their uh, platform just in Q1 and Q2. So once they start paying influencers and influencers feel much more confident in using the platform in the same way that they use YouTube, that is going to have, and that's probably going to happen before 2016. So by the end of the year, we're going to see massive changes around that. And clients using much more creators as well and influencers on other platforms, including Facebook, but also Snapchat, um, Instagram. So that, for me, are going to be quite big game changers coming up. More content that's uh, or more variations of content that allows mobile and video to be more um, to have more benefit and for those benefits to be more measurable. I also think we haven't really spoken about programmatic, and I think uh, the rise of programmatic channels specifically for video, we're seeing a lot 
of momentum beginning to gather specifically around the video area and I think the last bit would be viewability I think this whole viewability debate is going to most definitely have to be solved for us for all of us to benefit I think mm. I think, yeah. go sorry. On, sorry. Here you go. Oh, go, on. I, know. You go okay, on. I was just going to say, I think, you know, I think it's the key to, to this year is going to be innovation as well. I think, you know, it's going to be about formats. It's going to be how, how we use the content, like you say, um, using sponsored content and things that the consumer wants to see and also avoids the ad blockers. Um, I think uh, relative, making it all very rele relevant to the consumer, again, um, is very important. Programmatic video, like you say, I think is going to be a, a huge growth this year because, again, you're making it more relevant. You're using data to make sure that the, the ads you're delivering uh, are, are a lot more relevant. Um, In-content video, I think, is going to be an in-read video, I think, is a fantastic format. Uh, and I think it's going to make huge strides this year because, you know, pre-roll is great, but pre-roll has kind of got to a point where consumers just accept pre-roll as part of the content. They know if they want to watch content, they'll watch a video ad and they'll skip it as soon as they can. Whereas if you're using um, very well-targeted and relevant in-read video, the consumer is much more likely to see it. They're much more likely to engage with it. So I think uh, in-read video format is going to be quite big um, along with the programmatic side. I think publishers are making, the top publishers are making a beautiful format, which as a consumer, it's more interesting than the news that you're trying to read, you know, so I think there's so much potential there with um, the formats, as you were saying, um, in the pub with the publishers themselves. So there's there's a lot of exciting things happening on mobile with video, you know, between Facebook and, you know, top tier publishers really pushing the creative possibilities. It's, it's really exciting for us, and we can finally present something that is native and mobile and content and all those buzzwords, like, together. Um, and really, you know, cr like create some imaginative um, work. I was going to say that maybe video seeders might disappear next year, but um, maybe it's a bit early, but um, it's kind of going towards that because um, I think at the moment the majority of uh, video is bought directly, so it's around like 60, 70 percent. Then there's video seeders and then there's programmatic, which is still tiny, even though people speak about programmatic pretty much every day in our industry. And I think programmatic is probably going to take, start going to take over and is going to uh, need uh, much less reliance on third party um, seeding uh, companies, which actually are the ones that have got greater problems around transparency and viewability and all that. So I think probably you know, going in that direction means that you solve uh, more than one problem uh, by really sorting the programmatic um, uh, offering out. Just lastly from me, I think in terms of bringing people into the experience of the communications, we have already touched on all the ways that we're going to be able to do that increasingly so in 2016, but it, more importantly for me on, on some, some angle is the measurement of all of these different uh, tools that we're using to bring people into the communications, um, which ones work best, which ones don't, what, we're trying to shift brand equity or sales, I think the measurement that joins the dots between um, that the experience somebody has and whether it affects them in the right way and whether they do something with that has become a bit more sophisticated, which means with a sort of an oversupply of options almost in terms of how we can bring someone into a story, what's effective actually delivering the, the results we need to on behalf of the brands that we're um, working with. I suppose that is actually one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? Mm. The amount of technology and the amount of deliverable platforms mm. across the whole scape of, it, of the digital sphere. How, how do you, you know, actually decide, obviously it's a case by case basis, but the, it's just, you know, how do you get the time to do that, I suppose? And, and how do you know where you need to go? Is there a lot of trial and error across mobile still at the moment in terms of, it's great, we can do this, we can bring it back, or is, are we too far down the road for that? Piloting. Oh, yeah. no, no, do you want to go? go? <laughs> I think uh, brands are much more open to uh, pilot and trial um, in in this area because they know that um, you can't just uh, be 100% sure that something is going to work and that it's going to work across a number of um, touch points because mobile connects to so many touch points and also uh, across so many markets. So, for instance, again, with Burberry, um, they have very much a trial and error approach um, in a, a kind of trying contained form even in the way they experiment with uh, out-of-home, digital, programmatic, and um, airport travel consumers. So um, they try, test, um, if something doesn't work, then they try in the next thing. And um, they have so many success uh, stories that, uh, for the, from the past five, a few years, so it certainly works as an approach. Yeah, I agree. It's all about test and measure. You know, it's very rare you'll find a brand that doesn't have a bit of budget for a test of something that they think is really exciting or could work. So you test it, you measure it. If it delivers the ROI, then, you know, you know for future reference that that's where you invest the, the, the bigger uh, the bigger amounts. Yeah, and I 
I think it's just setting those benchmarks of like by this year, by this year, we need to be hitting this much in say digital and mobile spend. And then you have to free the teams to test and learn. So if somebody senior who's setting the budget acknowledges that, you know, there is going to be money spent on testing and learning, then whatever the results are, just pure learnings, and you, you're getting something in return. Um, but it's important, we've seen organizations and some of our clients where they say, you know, by a certain date, we need to be hitting you know, this amount in digital. And so however you get there, make sure, <laughs> make sure we're learning something from it and make sure it's getting better and better. So, because by the time we get to 2018, you know, we will have learned what we need to and optimized all along the way. So yeah, big, look, you know, big ambitions are important. Learning plan's critical. I mean, um, on Unilever, some of the brands I work with, we have a 70-20-10 approach. So 70% of your budget is doing things that you know work for your brand and know that worked in the past. 20% is trying new things on those same platforms to ensure that you're getting the most out of those platforms. And then the 10 is new things that you haven't, or whether it's new to category or new to um, advertising in total. So you can then, you're learning, constantly learning, is that platform being as effective as it can be? Or is this new thing potentially more or less effective than what we're already doing? So unless you've got that in place, it's, it's, it becomes an arbitrary metric. Are we spending enough in digital? It should be, as you're saying, how much are we learning from this space in, in order to hit the KPIs that we need to hit going forwards? Only your brands were like Unilever. <laughs> <laughs> we would. Uh, yeah, it would be a great place. I just think in the mobile space, technology is changing all the time. As soon as we have a solution in place, I don't know, if, uh, let's just say a DSP, you know, 18 months later, that's already out of date. New functionality, new platforms come around all the time. So the, the importance of having this sort of approach, which allows you to constantly test and, ev and evaluate and learn, is critical in our space. And I think there's many brands out there that don't give you the freedom. I understand why, you know, we've, they have hard business metrics to hit and maybe there isn't the place to test, learn and innovate. But um, you might suggest to those brands that if they're not brave enough now, that they are certainly going to be losing in the future. So yeah. it's critical, I believe. I mean, the, the easiest way is either to say, look, here's what your competitors doing. They're doing something interesting. Therefore, you know, you're probably missing out on something there. Or you can, you can actually accrue those learnings by doing it for yourself. So it's either one or the other. You're either going to lose out on an opportunity or, or lose out on an opportunity to learn because your you know, competitors are doing so. So, yeah, it's difficult, but, you know, So we're in a we're in a quite a good place, I think, from a mobile and video as as to where we were kind of two three years ago. I think we're really kind of on the front foot. We kind of understand where the the issues lie, where the big challenges lie, how we achieve that. And believe it or not, that has been just under an hour we've spent discussing this. We could have spoken for a lot longer. But uh, I wanted to say thank you very much to our panelists, to Alex, to Matt, to Tia, to Dominic, to Shen. Lovely to have you here. Welcome to the the, the first M and M roundtable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.